I am Eric Zygmunt, the Executive Director of Golden Gate Regional Center, one of the 21 regional centers. I think most of you know we serve San Mateo, San Francisco, and Marin County, about 10,000 people overall. Um, I'm delighted to be joined in this panel um, by three wonderful partners and experts in affordable and accessible housing, uh, Fatima Auer from the Kelsey, and who is the Director of Field and Capacity Building, uh, Jan Stokely, the Executive Director of Housing Choices, and Darren Lowndes, the Executive Director of the Housing Cho Consortium of the East Bay. So you'll get a well-rounded view of housing and some of the issues around housing. I'm just gonna show you one snapshot here of where we're headed today in the next hour or so. Um, where I'll just frame the topic a little bit and try to get out of the way um, and have you hear brief presentations from Fatima and Jan and Darren. And then we'll have some um, discussion around sort of you know, seminal questions about what's happening in this space for the people we serve. Um, and then we'll try to end on time so we can get to that question and answer period and answer um, questions from you all. So um, that's sort of our goal today. Um, in terms of framing this, I really uh, thought a lot about how over the last five years, housing has been, uh, you know, thought a lot about how this connects to the conference and the great history of this uh, incredibly important developmental disabilities update conference from UC San Francisco. Um, and I wanted to start with the idea that it seems obvious to some folks, but it has garnered a lot of attention nationally. And that's the housing is a component of healthcare. It's a component of physical health. It's a component of mental health. It's a component of emotional health. Really, um, it is one of those fundamental needs as Leinani was mentioning, um, along with the food security that makes all other things um, possible. That old Maslow's hierarchy of, of needs, you have to have a place to, to be and, a, and feel safe and, and enough to eat to be able to access your civil rights and your community rights. So the state of Hawaii has done a lot of work in demonstrating that um, housing is a, a aspect of healthcare and our own health plan of San Mateo has done work with four different housing partners, including uh, Brilliant Corners around this, this concept. So I wanted to say that to start off, um, Golden Gate Regional Center serves around 6,000 adults in our three counties and housing is just a critical priority. Um, we've been trending over the last uh, 20 years, 15 years to more independent and empowered housing. You saw maybe that our sort of touchstone um, phrase for Golden Gate is we wanna support lives of liberty and opportunity. And to do that, people have, a, have to have a place that they can call home. Um, but we live in a very high cost area. And so as we try to create more independent and empowered housing situations, uh, we need all options. And um, you know, group homes pu pushed partially by the home and community-based waiver final rule, but also just by general trends of civil rights have tended to um, become smaller and not shared rooms for adults. The old six packs are starting to wane as a service model, although they definitely have been very useful over the last 30 years um, in favor of, you know, four, three or four bedroom homes where people have their own bedroom. And then a lot of set aside um, affordable and accessible housing, as you'll hear today. We lose group homes in our area because of the cost. A lot of mom and pops, you know, do it for a long time, decades, and don't have a family member to turn it over to. So Amanda, who you heard from earlier, and I are always looking for this idea of rescue housing where we want to keep all the um, places we can. Part of the Lanterman Act sort of um, um, introduction or civil, uh, Bill of Rights is to say that we're part of our charge is to not dislocate people from their home communities. And it's very hard in our area if we can't continue to create housing opportunities. Um, so the, the last thing I would say is to frame this is that regional center, the blessing and curse of the regional center Lanterman Act system is it created this entitlement uh, that, that is like no, no other in the nation that gives every person with a developmental disability the right to services and doesn't have the waiting lists that other, other uh, states have. 
But sort of the curse part was we were insulated for those 50 years from the rest of the community. And I think, I know our strategic plan has worked hard to help us focus on reaching out to clinicians. And this conference is a great foundation for that, as well as other partners in the community and really be agents of change in the community rather than just supports for the individuals we serve. So in that regard, I'm really happy um, to have the chance to introduce the, these three speakers and have, um, have them first tell you a little bit about each of their uh, organizations and the incredible work it does and how it bridges the worlds of, kind of regional center support with the, with the incredibly important world of affordable, creating affordable and accessible housing for most folks we serve who have extremely low income. So we're going to start off today with Fatima Auer, the Director of Field and Capacity Building, and she's going to tell you a little bit about the Kelsey. Thank you for that introduction. Um, the Kelsey is so happy to be here and to be included with this um, wonderful group of nonprofit providers. So I'm just gonna share my screen. So um, I'm with the Kelsey and um, I personally have been on the team since last summer. So um, our mission is really to pioneer disability forward housing solutions that open doors to homes and opportunities for everyone. And the little addendum that I'll put to that is that we are very focused on being one co-led by people with and without disabilities. And also number two, creating housing solutions that don't just include people with disabilities, but um, where communities where people with and without disabilities live side by side. So that is very important for me to know. Um, I'll read off some of these statistics that are the problem, which I'm sure you all know. So 61 million Americans have disabilities and their housing, their basic housing needs are not being met. So one of the problems is cost and affordability, which Eric already referred to. And uh, one shocking um, statistic is that people that rely on SSI for their entire income, there is no major metropolitan area where those people who rely on SSI can, can afford basic housing. Um, one of the other problems is access. So when I say this, I mean access to the physical spaces that housing creates. And less than 6% of the national housing stock um, is accessible for people with disabilities, which is... Um, which means that even when people can afford housing, they can't find housing that fits in with their access needs. Um, leading to the next problem, which is that of supply. There, there just isn't enough housing for to match the needs that we have. And two interesting statistics here. One is that less than 12% of adults with disabilities own or rent their own homes. And it's estimated that over 40% of homeless individuals are people with disabilities. And, and the last category is um, that of discrimination. People with disabilities are routinely discriminated against and 55% um, of housing discrimination um, is based on disability. So I love this graphic because it gives you um, a visual to the kind of communities that we're trying to create. 
so historically, people with disabilities were really segregated and isolated in institutions, homeless shelters, disability specific housing. And what we've moved to is great progress, but we have a long way to go yet. So we've moved into this state where yes, people with disabilities might be included, but they're still segregated in their own pod. Um, going over some of the questions today, um, one of the questions is about set-asides. And I think about that term and even the term set-aside sounds like you're, you're setting the people with disabilities aside from everyone else. So this last house where all the dots are integrated, that is the kind of housing solutions that we're trying to provide where people are fully included and immersed in whatever housing communities we um, build. And so if you don't take anything else away um, from this presentation, it should be that the Kelsey is all about affordable, accessible, and inclusive housing. Um, affordable because like Eric mentioned, um, a lot of people with disabilities are on the lower income side and we need to provide housing for all income levels. Um, accessibility is, is, like I mentioned before, about um, physical access to the spaces um, and making sure that people can not only access the dwelling themselves, but also like anyone else, I have guests over and have it, um, have their housing be accessible to not only them, but to also um, family and friends and people that might want to come over and visit. And then maybe most importantly is having housing that is inclusive. Um, one of the things that the Kelsey really um, strives for is um, this aspect of cross-disability housing, where it's not just disability specific, but we want to include all disabilities and all kinds of access needs, because that is the type of community that we really want to lift up and promote. Um, so just a little bit about um, the communities that are um, in process right now. We have a housing pipeline of over 240 homes. And one is in the downtown San Jose area. And the other is in San Francisco's Civic Center neighborhood, um, right near City Hall. And we are launching um, a pilot program of our inclusion concierge at um, a building that is already operational in Oakland. So um, this gives you a little peek at what we have going on in terms of creating housing. And I just wanted to throw this out here. This is um, something that we've been working on and that we first launched about six months ago. So it's called the Housing Design Standards for accessibility and inclusion. And these are really a holistic set of guidelines that were designed for and by architects, developers, and designers, really um, focusing on um, not just one type of accessibility for one type of disability, but looking at it as a holistic set of things that would make housing accessible for the, the largest amount of people. We all know that traditionally accessibility has really been limited to 
wheelchair users and ramps and things, which are very important, but um, it's also important that we created impact areas within the, have the design standards. And these impact areas include physical mobility, cognitive access, visual hearing, support needs, and health and wellness. So we're looking at the whole person, not just the diagnosis that you received, but um, things when it comes to sensory or um, cognitive needs that a person might have, the design standards covers all of that. Um, our theory of change, one thing that I'm really proud about the Kelsey is that we not only build communities, but we also are very involved in system change and policy advocacy. So one really feeds the other. The systems change enables, supports, and scales our work that we're doing in building communities. And that links back to changing systems and that we, our housing is able to inform, validate, and demonstrate um, the model and how it can work. Um, just a little bit more about the, the two sides of the same coin. Um, actually building uh, disability forward housing, but on, on the other hand, advancing policy and changing systems needed to make uh, disability forward housing the norm rather than the exception. Um, we are a very young organization. We've been around um, three years now, and this is just kind of a highlight reel of things that we're very proud of. So I already spoke about the 240 homes that are in development. We have trained almost a thousand advocates and partnered with field leaders in housing policy and design. And lastly, we have unlocked um, funding mechanisms. Uh, and actually, we received the first investment from Google's housing fund. Um, and we also received seed funding from the Chain Zuckerberg Initiative. So um, as I'm sure a lot of you know, it um, sometimes it can be few and far between in terms of private, public, and philanthropic funds, but um, I'm happy to say that um, we have unlocked over $48 million in um, these funding opportunities. And that is my time. So um, you can check out the Kelsey at, um, the Kelsey.org, and I'll pass it back to Eric. Thank you so much, Fatima. Uh, I, I loved a lot of what you said, particularly around the language, how we encode discrimination in historical language like set asides, and how the the idea of access can be opened up to be much more, much more meaningful. I also really appreciate that Kelsey has been focused for the three years and a couple of years in preparatory to really trying to demonstrate replicable and scalable housing. And if we can do it in the Bay Area, you really can do it anywhere because of the cost drivers in, in, our, um, in our area. And I cannot tell you how excited I am about the Kelsey San Francisco. I know the folks in San Andreas are very excited about the Kelsey San Jose. So thanks again, Fatima, and I'm sure the, the questions will roll in. Um, and I think this is a great transition to um, Housing Choices and their Executive Director, Jan Stokely. Jan and I have known each other for a long time, and she has done work, their organization in, in the San Andreas Regional Centers, Fort County area, and now in our San Mateo area, and really demonstrated an incredible amount of traction in 
getting affordable set asides. There's that word again, but it means that you know over 50 individuals can live in their own apartment and without the efforts of H, uh, HCC or housing choices, that wouldn't have been possible. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Jan. Great. Thank you, Eric. And I know time's limited, so feel free to interrupt me and give me a time check. Um, thanks, everyone. It's great to be here with you to talk a little bit about housing for people with developmental disabilities. I want to give you a quick introduction to housing choices because it'll help you understand where my comments are coming from. Um, we were created specifically to address the housing needs of people with developmental disabilities um, who are served by the regional center system. So a very, very specific focus. And I think that focus has been our strength. Uh, we were founded in 1997 because parents and service providers saw that the regional center services alone would not result in opportunities for independent living. People needed access to affordable housing coordinated with supportive services to make a successful transition from living in the family home to their own apartment. So this is a map of our service area. Um, when we were founded, we focused on Santa Clara County. That's still our largest county. Um, there are 12,000 people in Santa Clara County with developmental disabilities. And uh, we have referrals of about 1,500 from that county. We also serve Santa Cruz, San Benito, and Monterey from an office in Watsonville. Um, and um, that, those counties are particularly affected by, um, you know, specific agricultural and other economic factors that make them somewhat different from the rest of the Bay Area. And then most recently, three years ago, we expanded into San Mateo County, which took us into collaboration with the Golden Gate Regional Center, which has been really great. So what's unique about Housing Choices is we're both a housing service provider and we're also um, a developer of affordable housing in partnership with affordable housing developers. I wanna talk about our services because I feel like our connection to the housing needs of the people we work with on a daily basis directly contributes to the success of our efforts to produce more inclusive housing in our high cost area. So we currently have referrals of more than 1700 people from um, our five counties who have developmental disabilities are served by the regional center and um, are looking to move into stable, safe, and affordable housing. Um, and what we do is we focus um, a service of developing a housing plan that's individualized for each person, um, helping stabilize existing housing that's often essential as housing costs continue to increase. Um, this can destabilize a person who's been stable for years. And we focus on searching for appropriate housing that meets the need of the individual and helping um, the individual get through that application process. So this is our single largest service. And what's important to understand about this service is that applying for affordable housing is not an easy process for anyone, um, but particularly if you have a developmental disability. So we're kind of the equivalent in the housing field of someone's job coach. Um, we're gonna help you find the right housing and get moved in and, and live there successfully um, because it's a pretty daunting process without support. Um, we also provide housing retention services. So I mentioned that we partner with affordable housing developers to have some apartments in affordable housing properties subject to a preference for people with developmental disabilities who receive services from the regional center. Um, I think the set aside term is maybe not um, as, as uh, I think the set aside term has evolved because it's important that the commitment of those units in the affordable housing properties uh, for people with developmental disabilities be documented legally and protected for the 55 year life of the property. Um, and so set aside is, is very strong, intend to communicate that the unit is there to create inclusive housing for the long-term um, and not to, to segregate people within the housing community. In fact, fair housing laws require affordable housing developers to distribute any units for people with disabilities 
throughout all aspects of the property and not in some kind of separate floor. Um, so just a little bit of a speech about set aside, um, but um, we um, currently have 27 properties where we're supporting residents with developmental disabilities to live successfully in a unit that is protected for the regional center to occupy, um, up to, to help a person occupy for the 55 year life of the project. And so we're there to help the individual maintain their lease compliance, monitor their health and well-being, and be a connection to the regional center and all the other service providers and keep our eyes on what's happening and pull people together when we see that that would be needed. And then we also focus on building community within the larger property. I think that's so important. So we are focused on um, neighbor relations, social events, and other activities to help people with developmental disabilities live um, in good community with their neighbors. So the number one concern of parents when they think about moving an adult with developmental disabilities into affordable housing is will the person be lonely? It's a real concern. Um, and so at our, at our partner properties where we have some units set aside for people with developmental disabilities, there is a big focus on fostering relationships both with uh, neighbors with developmental disabilities and neighbors without. So um, I also want to talk about a growing service need um, that we're addressing, which is homeless case management for people with developmental disabilities at risk of homelessness or trying to exit homelessness. Um, it's a real concern and it's definitely a growth service. Every year we get more of these referrals. Um, and so with with this program, we're partnering with our county homelessness continuum of care to make sure that people with developmental disabilities are supported to be served by that separate system. Um, and then finally, the, the program that we're most proud of, it's our flagship program, is our housing development activities. Um, we organize people with developmental disabilities in communities across our high cost area um, to be able to live in typical affordable housing. Um, and so we currently support 350 people living in units in 27 different part uh, rental properties. So our particular units that are protected for the life of the property um, total 350. And that's in 27 different apart properties. So we're, we're really focused on inclusion and we try not to have more than 25% of the units subject to this preference because we wanna foster inclusion. There are some financing incentives to having more people than 25%, um, but most of ours are below 25%. So the benefits of this inclusive housing model, the units that are set aside, if you will, are protected and we're able to maintain a sheltered wait list. So we're help, able to help regional center clients get on the waiting list for that property and navigate the wait list and monitor the wait list status. And when there's a vacancy and they get called for the vacancy, we're gonna notify them and we're gonna help them through the process. Um, so um, that's really, really important because there's so much demand for affordable housing without someone like Housing Choices on site protecting the units that have been committed to people with developmental disabilities, that can be eroded over time. Um, our units are designed to be affordable for someone without a Section 8 voucher. Um, only about 20% of the population in our area that's eligible for a Section 8 voucher gets one. Um, it can take 40 years if you just look at the numbers to get a voucher. So we're really striving for deep levels of affordability for someone who does not have a voucher. And that's gotten increasingly difficult because affordable rents are pegged to area median income, which is increasing in our high cost area. Um, another fundamental premise of housing choices is that the person will have a lease in their own name and they can change supportive service providers as they wish. They can also move out of the housing and keep their service provider. Um, so the independence of the housing tenure 
from the supportive services is really a fundamental principle and we think it's critically important. Um, our housing is near public transit, shopping and services. Most of our adults do not drive or own a car. So we really focus on being part of transit oriented, enriched communities. And again, we're protecting a 55 year commitment of affordable housing to the population served by the regional center. Uh, um, Jan, can you wrap it up maybe in two or yeah. three minutes? Okay, sure. Thanks. So this is a photo of um, families testifying at the South San Francisco City Council. We have one existing commitment of housing in South San Francisco and one that's in the works. Um, and I think it's important to the quote here, I was completely unaware of this particular housing need until our residents spoke up. Um, that's really important because I think we're part of every community in our high cost area, but we're pretty invisible. And so a lot of our work is organizing our clients and, and families to get out there and tell their housing story. So we have a number of new partner properties in development, which we're really proud of. Um, but I just wanna talk about some challenges ahead um, because as you, as you saw when I talked about the increase in homeless referrals, we are really lacking solutions at the policy level and um, our local organizing efforts, while they're incredibly important, we, we need to do more. So um, we're looking at this chart, which shows growth in the IDD population in California um, on the left um, between 2015 and 2021. You're probably all familiar with that. It's mirrored in the Bay Area, not quite as dramatically because of the high cost of housing. I think people are being displaced. Um, so the other factor that's contributing to increased demand is the increase in the number of adults living past um, the age of 61, which is a national trend and is very much reflected in the regional center system. I wanted to show this graph because you see the decline in the adults 42 to 61 in the Bay Area. Um, these, these, these ones that are on the downside here, um, I believe that is not due to death, but due to homelessness and disconnection from the regional center system or displacement from the Bay Area to lower cost housing areas. So, um, and I think it's the age correlation is just right about the time when we would see an increase in the loss of the primary caregiver, the parent. So this chart shows decline in licensed care facilities, which Eric talked about. Um, I think that trend is gonna continue, um, particularly in the Bay Area where the single family home has so much value. Um, and the, this chart shows declining access to affordable housing. And um, this is kind of hard to read, but the, the line, oops, the line is showing um, the percentage of the rent for a one bedroom, extremely low income apartment. That's the lowest level of affordability that most projects reach. Um, as a percent of the maximum SSI award. And what you'll see is it goes up over here on the right, and these are our Bay Area coastal California counties. So there's tremendous inequity created by the dependence on the SSI system, which the SSI award is not correlated to local differences in cost of living. And so that's why we see displacement and homelessness of our population, particularly in our high cost coastal counties. Um, so what that means is as our, our residential option declines, we're seeing more and more reliance on the family home as the primary residence for uh, adults with developmental disabilities. This chart shows the growth in the adult population in California and the Bay Area. And then this is the growth in the adult population living in the family home. So much higher rate of growth than the total growth rate of the population. Um, we've seen some gains in people living in their own apartments, but not nearly enough to keep up with the growth and the numbers still living in the family home. 
Mm -hmm. um, so are, we have a system that values people living in the family home. I think that's great, but I think as parents age, we need to be mindful that they face some significant health and financial impacts and they need support to create a plan for adults. And we also see more adults with significant co-occurring mental health and medical needs, and they're particularly difficult to support in the family home. And then finally, and most important to emphasize is that as the regional center population continues to grow in racial, ethnic, and economic diversity, increasingly the family home is itself not a stable housing solution. That's great, um, Jan. I wonder if you can leave it there. Your slides are so rich, and they're, and I know people will be able to dig into them and, okay, and probably sure. reach out to you. But yeah, thank um, you. Yeah, just on that last point, we, you know, our board of directors has recently um, embarked on a on a journey to um, really do listening sessions with the community around folks um, doing planning for the future, both in terms of housing, whether they live in their family home in particular, but also in other places. Um, so I think that is really, really tied to us being able to serve better underserved ethnic and language communities where there's different cultural um, maybe drivers around how living arrangements are made, but it also, I think the planning both, you know, in housing financially and in terms of services and support and getting on lists early um, is really, really, really important. And as Jan often says that, their urgent and emergency housing requests could be reduced if we supported people better in that, in that planning for the future. So now I'm just gonna transition to um, Darren Lowndes and at Housing Consortium of the East Bay. Darren also, and I also go back a long way, at least to the closure of Agnews Developmental Center and the movement of 350 people into homes and new lives in the community. So. Darren has a long history of this and uh, as, as the others have, and he will tell you about housing consortium. Thank you, Eric. And thanks to Fatima and Jan for rich presentations. And I'll try not to repeat too many things um, as I talk a little bit about um, HCB's activities in the East Bay, uh, but also uh, I'm gonna share a little bit on a survey that was uh, created uh, done by the Lanterman Housing Alliance um, in 2018. No disclosures. So HCB creates inclusive communities for people with developmental disabilities <clears throat> or other special needs through quality affordable housing. And we do this, uh, so you know, we currently, um, we're focused on three activities, uh, supportive housing, which includes development, management and services, uh, emergency housing and homeless interventions and housing access services. HCB was formed in 1996, and our first supportive housing property went into construction in 2005. On the supportive and emergency housing side, uh, we have 45 supportive housing properties across two counties. Uh, those house over uh, 340 households, and then we have 10 emergency housing interventions um, scattered throughout uh, both Alameda and Contra Costa counties uh, for it serving a total of over 600 clients. On the development side, HCB focuses on smaller scale housing development, but we've successfully recently partnered with other housing providers to create larger housing communities um, using low income housing tax credits. And these larger communities um, also are more integrated uh, as our folks are part of a larger community versus being, you know, um, some of our smaller properties are 100% intellectual developmental disabilities. So um, we feel uh, we're very happy with that transition. Um, and, but we're also going to we're going to we're going to build housing how, whenever, however and whenever we can, so um, that model may shift over time. Um, when we're working with other housing developers, we typically facilitate cooperation between that developer and the regional center. Um, and our regional center that we work with is Regional Center of the East Bay. Uh, we support the disability verification process, and we also um, start the service and support assessment process with each of the uh, folks who are likely to move in. So I'm gonna shift gears a little bit to the Lanterman Housing Alliance. Uh, the Lanterman Housing Alliance is a statewide organization that serves as a catalyst for the creation of affordable, supportive housing for Californians with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Um, back in the mid, uh, well, back about five years ago, um, no longer, six years ago now, uh, 
LHA worked with the Corporation for Supportive Housing and the State Council on Development of Disabilities to draft the statewide strategic framework um, and that was originally um, presented to the State Council, who was our funder, um, in the fall of 2018. Um, HCB is a charter member of LHA and we've remained active um, in that organization. So one thing that we that we worked on is uh, you know we 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 we, we did a, a large, wide, uh, very wide spanning uh, look at uh, affordable housing within the state of California for our folks, and so part of this work is of the you know this we, we brought together a bunch of data and um, tried to get a good look at what was going on. So of the thirty five. 39 million Californians, approximately 600,000 are living with intellectual or developmental disabilities as based on the federal definition of, of, uh, of developmental disability. Um, today, uh, of the 21 regional centers across the state, they serve over 300,000 clients with IDD and provide a long list of services that are funded through the Department of Developmental Services. Um, of these folks, uh, served by the regional centers, TDS has, uh, collects a bunch of data. Um, and some of that data is uh, on where people currently live. So as you'll see here, 63% live in a family home. I think that's um, highlighted by some of the great stuff that Jan shared. 16% uh, live independently with independent living services or supportive living services. 15% live in a congregate residential facility and the rest are divided among other settings, including those who are unhoused, as Jen has pointed out, that number um, continues to grow. What the DDS data does not show is are, are clients living where they live out of choice or out of need? Is it the only option available? Um, how many consumers are living with aging caregivers? How many are in poor health who have made no uh, alternative arrangements for their children when they are no longer able to care for them? So, you know, as Jen mentioned, that number is increasing and that putting us in a, a potentially into, um, into those emergency housing placement situations um, more and more often. How many consumers live in unsafe, overcrowded market rate apartments facing punishing rent increases? Uh, we know that if it, throughout the state, not just in the Bay Area and the coastal, um, coastal cities, throughout the state, uh, market, rate, market rents are going up, continue to go up much faster than the SSI rate, pay rate, as Jan pointed out. And how many consumers are living in licensed group homes are in, and are facing imminent eviction because their housing has been sold into the private market when operators retire? And um, Eric mentioned that you know at GGRC, that's a big focus, trying to keep those those homes online, um, you know, as as the operators transition out. So to answer these questions, um, the LHA and our partners launched a survey um, as part of that statewide strategic framework. And the survey um, was accessed through SurveyMonkey, it's pretty user-friendly, um, was directed and modified for eight self-identified categories. A total of 878 responses were received um, during the summer of 2018, and among these categories, 98 self-advocates and consumers, 323, uh, which is our largest category, were family members living with someone with an intellectual developmental disability, 88 family members who do not currently live with someone with a developmental disability, 147 service provider staff, 98 regional center staff, so on and so forth. I won't go through the whole list. The survey provided firsthand experience and opinions from people directly involved in the affordable housing situation for the IDD community, for, and it provided a qualitative look at the need for housing, uh, affordable housing for these folks. Questions were generally multiple choice and the respondent could list as many options as they wanted. Um, and then most questions also included an opportunity for the respondents to provide qualitative answers under other or please describe. These answers were really the, the, the fruit of the survey. Um, they provided abs uh, absolutely illuminating, often heartbreaking context to the quantitative data and they were a window into each individual life experience. We asked one question of every category. What is their judgment? What in their judgment was the major barrier to the person with IDD living in the housing of his or her choice? Uh, as you might expect, um, 70, over 70% 70 uh, said a lack of affordable housing. That's, that's a no-brainer. Um, and also the, the other side of that coin is 62% said they had a lack of sufficient income. If you don't have enough income, you 
all, all housing is unaffordable. And also, as mentioned um, prior to Fatima's uh, piece, is there's a lack of accessible housing, and over 37% of the respondents said that was a distinguishing factor for them. And then other service providers and regional center staff identified some, some issues, systemic issues like long waiting lists for Section 8 vouchers, landlords who won't accept Section 8 vouchers. And they also mentioned that it was very important to have a range of housing options because, as we know, um, one size does not fit all. So uh, some of the individual category responses uh, for with, with consumers felt that uh, while 45% were living at home, 85% of the, those said they would like to live independently, either alone or with roommates. And they cited, obviously, all the reasons for limited finances, lack of affordable and lack of accessible housing. What would they need to overcome those barriers? They need um, additional financial assistance, which could come in the, in the form of a housing choice voucher or mainstream voucher. More, to, more on that later. Um, safety is also a big concern. Um, and the proximity to transportation, family and friends were also issues. Families reported, uh, well, I'm, I'm not gonna go through this whole slide, but what, because I think we're limited in time here, but what I'm going to um, really focus on is what, what we found um, across the board is that families with more resources, um, you know, more financial resources, tended to be happier with their the housing outcomes for um, their, the consumer uh, that either lived with them or lived outside the home, um, which is not, uh, again, it's a no brainer, but it was very illuminating to actually see this um, in, in the survey responses. So housing advocates and NPOs um, continue to continue to focus on creating new affordable homes through production. But while this is critical, other strategies um, are also needed. And one of those strategies is housing access services. And this, I'm just gonna uh, briefly touch on this. Uh, it's a relatively new service uh, under service code 089, um, and it's available across the state. It, this somehow, the one thing that was really great about this is it, it, it uh, about housing access services, is it allowed uh, regional centers to vendorize groups like uh, housing access, uh, housing choices, and HCB and others across the state to actually provide individual housing transition services and individual housing and tenancy sustaining services. Um, group, some groups are doing this prior to 089, but um, but what by by 089 coming on through the home and community based services waiver process, uh, we were able to now get uh, get it uh, uh, reimbursed through Medicaid or Medi-Cal in, in California, which is big help to the system, but it also, it means that regional centers are able to, 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 to direct of, um, to us towards housing access services and still maintain some financial sustainability in the process. So I see Eric is shaking or, or nodding, he agrees. Uh, let me see here. So it, it, in the East Bay, um, in 2018, HCB entered into an MOU with Contra Costa County Housing Authority to secure non-elderly disabled mainstream vouchers for adults receiving services through, from the Regional Center of the East Bay. After those vouchers were awarded or connected to individuals, then we, uh, the Regional Center that vendorized HCB for the new housing code, which is fantastic. Um, by bringing together the vouchers and housing access services, HCB was able to successfully move 33 consumers into affordable homes where the tenant rent is equal to 30% of their income, truly affordable. Uh, and HCB was notified earlier this month that there is an additional seven vouchers that are now available. So we'll be, we're working with the regional center to identify our, their most at risk folks um, who are either currently unhoused or at risk. Uh, the scope of the mainstream voucher program is limited to the number of vouchers available to RCB consumers. So HCB continues to work with the housing authority to get more vouchers from the feds. And we would love to scale our, our housing access services program similar to what Jan has accomplished um, with housing choices. In addition to the uh, working with the housing authority vouchers, we've, we have also have been receiving um, referrals for housing access services for other regional center of the East Bay consumers, which has been really helpful to grow the program. But um, without the vouchers, the job is that much more difficult to accomplish and um, it's much more challenging. So thank you for your time and I'll wrap it up.
Thanks so much, Darren. Um, really, really appreciate all three of you, Fatima, Jan, and Darren. Um, we want to take the next 10, 15 minutes to have a bit of a panel discussion and um, hopefully get through at least two of, of the questions we had sort of thought about would be useful or I had. Um, and the first one I would just frame by saying about five years ago, I met with a, a really um, savvy and progressive and uh, effective affordable housing group in, well known throughout California. And when we talked about developmental disabilities, their exec said, you mean, what is a developmental disability? Do you mean people in wheelchairs? One of those moments where you're like, oh, I have to, you know, undo some assumptions here. And I think the last five years have seen a flurry allowing the Housing Alliance and, and the work of Jan and, and Fatima and, and many others and Darren have brought affordable and accessible housing into view. But my first question for the panel, and I'll put it in chat um, so that everybody can see it, is to ask you all, the panelists uh, here, to talk a little bit about how difficult and arduous and time-consuming it is to have these um, units that people with developmental disabilities will have access to in these affordable housing developments. It was certainly an education for me to be able to see um, what the process for affordable and accessible housing is and, um, and how you have to reach out to multiple partners and multiple funders. So anyone wanna jump in on that and just talk a little bit about how you, how you actually get the, the um, units in place for the folks we serve? I'm, I'm happy to talk a little bit about that. I'm sure um, others will chime in. So for Housing Choices, we've been working more deeply in each community to identify people with developmental disabilities and families and organize them to educate city council because housing is fundamentally authorized and entitled at the local level by the city council. So having an engaged community that's showing up at city council and planning commission is kind of the groundwork. Um, the other piece that's really important is to um, reach out to developers, educate them, learn about their housing plans and show them how our community can be an asset to their housing plans. Um, they're uh, working in a system that's tremendously underfunded there's not enough state and local financing dollars for affordable housing. So big part of our work has been to advocate with our County Board of Sup Supervisors to create a dedicated pot of financing for people with developmental disabilities. So in Santa Clara County, we have $40 million um, awarded, which will provide um, 4 million for 10 projects that provide inclusive housing for people with developmental disabilities. So having a funding source, either at the state or local level that incentivize developers to work with us is really helpful. Um, and then I'll just add that um, the projects take a long time. Um, we're leasing up a project in downtown San Jose where we have 25 of 135 apartments. Um, when I joined Housing Choices 10 years ago, that project was on my work plan. And so it's taken 10 years to get it leased up. Yesterday, I was at a groundbreaking um, for a project in Sunnyvale where we have 23 of 93 units. Um, we started working on that project in 2016 when the city of Sunnyvale issued a competitive RFP to affordable housing developers. So it's taken six years to get from that RFP to groundbreaking, and then it'll take another two years of construction to get to occupancy. So the projects are long, expensive, and complicated, and you need to have staying power, and you need to be deeply um, engaged at the local community level. That's great, and you know these these developments can cost 120 million dollars. So it is always braiding funding from several multiple sources, and um, yeah, the Department of Developmental Services has done some investments in these. Uh, units that'll be available for long, long, long term, 55 year or longer leases. Um, but you're talking about a quarter million dollars or something for a unit, but it can house generations of, of folks in, in ways that meet their aspirations. 
So um, Darren or Fatima, anything on the on the um, partnering with others and getting these things done? Just wanted to mention that, um, that uh, thankfully to, uh, to SB 812, um, it requires that local jurisdictions include um, the housing need uh, information and plan to address the housing need um, of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities within the housing elements, which are uh, documents that are uh, updated every seven years as part of um, each local jurisdiction's general plan. And that having language specifically in those housing elements about our, the need of our folks, um, as well as plans to address that need, goes directly to what Jan was saying. It, when the local cities and counties make determinations on how to, um, how to award their funds for development, you know, we just need to be able to go and pull that information from those housing elements to, 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 to support that, uh, that our folks be included. I love that stuff because it's really about social change um, and, uh, and how disability work of support and disability forward um, philosophy and, and thinking as the Kelsey talks about it in Fatima really benefits the whole community. You know, there's this idea of sort of the curb cut effect where this access to the basic sidewalks have helped so many people, older people using walkers or parents using, um, you know, carriages or, or uh, running strollers. So um, I wanted to get to that second question, which I love so much because I think it's been an evolution is, and we've touched upon it um, about how the voice of people with, um, developmental and intellectual disabilities and all disabilities affect affordable housing efforts. And I know Fatima, you wanted to maybe say something on that. Yeah, the one piece that I wanted to add was piggybacking on what Chan said about education. A lot of the developers don't know what we mean when we say accessible and inclusive. So, there is some education that needs to happen so that we're all on the same page about what we mean when we say accessible and inclusive. That's and it. I'll just add the same education is needed at, with elected officials, city council members, planning commissions. Um, when we bring people to city council meetings, um, it's oftentimes the very first time a city council member has been made aware of the housing need. Um, and there is also somewhat of an assumption that people with developmental disabilities are, it's a cradle to grave support system from the regional center and cities don't have to worry about that housing need. So we have to educate elected officials that the regional center doesn't pay for the cost of housing and that the folks in their community who wanna live independently are competing for for affordable housing that's often out of reach and, and many, many others are, are seeking it as well. So we have to do that same work with um, our elected officials at the local level and also I think at the state level. Absolutely. And you know that the reason that the Lanterman Act didn't anticipate paying for housing costs was the idea was to give and is to give people equal access to live, learn, work and play. And so, you know, as a regional center, we can bring support to individuals, but we have very limited areas where we can do anything to help people um, afford housing. And so these partnerships with you all is, is one way we can do that. Once somebody can have a, an actual place to have a more empowered, independent life, we can bring support in terms of family home agencies or supported living, independent living skills. We can bring the support to give equal access but we have not had the ability to pay for much of the, of the development. Any other ways the, the voice of people with developmental disabilities you saw in Fatima's uh, presentation that I just think it's fascinating, the 300 elements on ADA that expands the idea of access, um, I think is a great step, was developed in partnership when you know, driven by architects. So they're speaking the language of building. Um, any other ways that we're bringing the voice of the people we serve to the um, to the attention of affordable housing folks? Okay, I can, oh, I can uh, yeah, just there have been a number of efforts um, over the last few years, kind of coordinated and um, 
by, th through the LHA, um, the state council and the Kelsey to impact uh, some of the statewide housing, uh, housing funding programs and making sure that we're, we're elevating our folks into priority population for those funds. Um, that's been a great opportunity to educate, um, educate uh, not just the state agencies, but the developers who use those programs um, every year. And uh, we, I, I think they're, even though we haven't been as successful as we'd like in getting some of the policies changed to exactly what we want, mm -hmm. we've got, there has been movement and that's been great. Um, but throughout that process, we've made it contacts with affordable housing developers out there who are now thinking about how to integrate our folks into their, into their developments um, and, you know, throughout the state and wherever they're doing their work. So uh, that's been really, really helpful. And it took the voice of, of, of folks with intellectual developmental disabilities to really push that point. Yeah, I think if it, you know, person-centered thinking has taught us anything, it's taught us to let people be the experts on their own experience, the people we serve. And I think it's really tied to leadership development. The Kelsey's done a, a good amount of that job as well. So um, I think that you're gonna see a larger voice in, in the leadership of people we serve. Jerry, do you think we should go to Q&A at this point? Yeah, I think we should go to okay. Q&A. And I don't know if you can see all the questions, um, Eric, but I'm going to start off with this one, which is uh, posed by uh, Clarissa Kripke. Um, and that's about accessibility has been limited to mobility ac accessibility, but for many autistic people, and we see the trend of increased numbers of, of autism, uh, lighting, mechanical sounds, ruggedized features, walls and windows, delayed egress, uh, they need to be considered too. Is there a movement to understand accessibility in broader terms? Um, I, I can comment on that. I'm sure Fatima will want to comment. Um, yes, definitely. I think we're thinking about accessibility holistically and, and not um, the way developers tend to think about it, such as, is the door wide enough? Is there room for a wheelchair to turn around in the bathroom? So we're trying to expand everyone's understanding of accessibility to include individualized specific needs. And there are fair housing laws that require affordable housing developers to make reasonable modifications to an apartment so that is fully accessible to the individual and we're constantly educating property managers in the community about that requirement. Um, and then secondly, I would say we're very focused on educating property managers in the development community that the um, service providers are part of the system that makes inclusion possible. And so thinking about accessibility as including an individual's right to supportive services um, that that is an integral part of creating an inclusive community. That's also very important. So I totally agree with the person who asked the question too often. People think about accessibility as a certain physical design. And in fact, there is a, a lot of individual modification that's needed. And also there is a dimension that supportive services need to be accommodated by property managers. Mm -hmm. I have a specific example. Oh, Fatima, go ahead. No, I just wanted to say that the design standards that the Kelsey has come up with definitely take into account more than just mobility access needs. The access needs cover cognitive and sensory and acoustic. So um, we're definitely on it and trying to push the design standards out to as many architecture firms and developers and designers that will listen. We are very committed to um, pushing these standards out and educating people on their importance. And, and we had a, a, a project that, one of the projects that was one of our photos in the presentation at HCB, um, uh, Jack Capon Villa in Alameda has an individual who, one of our, our first tenants in, who is uh, extremely sensitive to sound and vibration. And we, by working with the service providers and, uh, and, and, and through the, the whole process of, of 
the move in, we went from a situation where nobody other than us <laughs> believed that he could make it there <laughs> um, to everybody getting on board and, and dealing with the modifications. So we, we added a, a additional sound dampening to, to his unit. We moved, uh, we made sure he had a unit as far away as possible from any of the, the larger heavy doors, the, you know, the fire doors and the, and the elevator to eliminate the vibrations. And he moved in in 2015 um, with our initial cohort and he's still there and he's doing great. Um, you know, we, and we've had to continue to make modifications throughout, um, throughout his time there. But as Jan said, that's our responsibility. And um, so it's, we feel like, um, you know, that's a great, a great uh, example of a success in addressing all aspects of accessibility. Fantastic. I want to, oh, just a, and on the question though, there's a, there was something brought up about delayed egress. And I think that's, that's a, would be a significant challenge in, um, in a supportive housing setting or an affordable housing setting. Um, so I just want to put that out there. There, there are, as much as we can do, there are, we're also limited as well. If I might jump in, there's several questions of the 10 or more that have been submitted on this topic. And thank you all, this is fantastic. Uh, the questions uh, that I can lump together seem to have a common thread. Where are the published standards for the uh, housing for people with IDDD? and those with mobility issues, those on the autism spectrum, where are they? And uh, are we in the IDDD uh, silo uh, communicating with schools of architecture? The UC Berkeley School of Architecture has a subset of people who are interested in, um, or at least it did have, who are interested in working with designs for, um, for people with IDDD and mobility issues. Um, the, we talk a lot about silos with mental health and developmental health and health in general. Is this another silo? So y'all have two minutes to answer that question. Um, <laughs> Okay. So I think there's actually quite a bit of work being done on accessibility. Um, and um, it's important that that work be showcased and analyzed in light of all the differences in the people we serve. Um, but I think the number one challenge to preventing homelessness among our population with intellectual and developmental disabilities is affordability. Um, so, you know, I just want to say the accessibility work is tremendously important. In San Andreas Regional Center, um, you know, there are many people who need physically accessible units. There are others with autism who need modifications. Same thing in GGRC. But without affordability, um, those folks are not going to be able to move into affordable housing. So our biggest single challenge I would advocate is um, the affordability gap. Yeah. And I would just direct people to the kelsey.org slash design. You can go there and download either a PDF version or an Excel version of the design standards that I mentioned. And um, passing them along to your architect or designer or developer is what we want. So it's available free on our website. And I encourage everyone who's interested to go and download their own copy. Thank you. And I would just add, it's been recently accomplished over the last six months or so. So really now is the time to get it out to your networks, at least as a first step to raise a consciousness around that design. The one question we didn't get to, and I know came up in the Q&A was around future planning, and we don't have time to cover it now, but it is more and more on our radar, as I mentioned, even our board of directors really looking at how do we support people, especially those in kind of their middle age within 30s and 40s and 50s of intellectual and developmental disabilities who need to plan for the future and the family needs to plan for the future. And obviously housing is plays a huge role in trying to meet people's needs and their aspirations, which is really what we should be doing. So just a quick comment to 
wrap up. I know there's lots of lots of still uh, issues to talk about and and questions, but I, I'm thinking back to Dr. Hutro's uh, uh, kickoff lecture this morning on health equity and focusing on prevention, and also knowing how important data is. I think it'd be interesting to look at data for individuals with I slash DD uh, who are housed and who are not housed to look at what the cost is to our healthcare system. Um, I suspect there's gonna be a big gap and that would be really great information to present to city planners as they're trying to look at their budgets. So uh, I, I think that would be an interesting way to also make the case of how terribly important this is. And then there's one final question on our list submitted. Uh, are there any published design standards and assessment tools for adult and pediatric outpatient clinical spaces? This is something that Jerry and I have pulled <clears throat> out for ages. The American Academy of Pediatrics does have um, some design standards for pediatric clinical spaces. It's not nearly enough, but I would suggest that the questioner go to the American Academy of Pediatrics Committee on Children with Disabilities for that. What about for internal medicine or family medicine space design, Jerry? Uh, well, actually the person who asked that is, is, uh, is one of our uh, faculty in general medicine and uh, we're actually working on a project to uh, to look at our own space in terms of, of how it works for people with disabilities. So to my, I don't, do not know of any public standards uh, uh, for the adult clinical space, but we will be uh, looking at that and searching for it for sure. One, one of the things you might do is look at the um, Disability Rights Education Defense Fund, DREDF's website. They did a project a few years ago on kind of first person narratives of uh, what people with disabilities uh, encounter when they try to access healthcare, it might point to some design elements. Great. Great. Thank you all. Thank you very much. I think you should all publish a white paper. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. That's what we need, another thing on our to-do list. Thanks yes. so much for the invitation. <laughs> uh, Fatima and Darren and Jan, you were wonderful. Excellent. Thank yeah. you all. Thank you.